Good morning, folks. My name is Jimmy Bashar with the ISO Stakeholder Affairs Group. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the California ISO Stakeholder Meeting to discuss the straw proposal for the still new Hybrid Resources Initiative. At this time, I'd like to introduce my colleagues in the room with me here today, beginning to my left. Deb Levine, Director of Infrastructure Contracts and Management. Repeat uh, Infrastructure Contracts. And Chris Devin with Policy. Thanks, folks. As you can see, this is our agenda for today's meeting. Uh, as you can see, we have much to cover with this initiative continuing to touch plenty of wholesale issues. Uh, first and foremost, however, we'd like to begin by clarifying the definition of what exactly a true hybrid resource is, sort of moving away from the two resource ID construct to the one resource ID model, and Chris will, of course, speak to that once we begin. Um, after that, we'll then discuss the various use cases and business drivers that motivate hybrid resource project developments. Uh, the purpose of this uh, topic really is in order to inform stakeholders of the appropriate configurations that best suits their project needs uh, for ISO markets. And then finally, before our lunch break, we'll plan on continuing our forecasting discussion from the issue paper discussion, if you recall. And then after lunch, as you can see, we'll pick right back up with our continued discussion from the issue paper on markets and systems, followed by proposal discussions on ancillary services, metering and telemetry, and then finally, resource adequacy. And then we'll conclu conclude the meeting discussing more of the process as we update you on our schedule and implementation timelines uh, prior to discussing the next steps. And uh, so with that, welcome. And as most know, this slide displays uh, a simple version of our stakeholder process uh, in which the ISO obtains both verbal and written feedback from stakeholders after publishing each paper or proposal, after which we would take the initiative to our Board of Governors for consideration for approval. Here's the current schedule for this initiative. As you can see, uh, we will ultimately be targeting the Board of Governors in Q2 next year. And we do ask for written comments after today's discussion um, and on the straw proposal by October 21st, as you can see. Um, and again, here are the straw proposal elements uh, as discussed. We'll begin by clarifying the definition of the hybrid resources and uh, the other topics are laid out as well, as I mentioned. Uh, in addition, calls and webinars are recorded for stakeholder convenience, allowing those who are unable to attend to listen to the recordings after the meetings the recordings will be publicly available on the ISO webpage for a limited time following the meetings. Of course, the recordings and any related transcriptions should not be reprinted without ISO's permission. And lastly, of course, if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand in the room, and then you would press the mic button once and release, and once again to turn it off. Uh, and then for everyone, we ask that you please state the name your name and the company that you represent. And for folks on the lines, we ask that you push pound two to enter the queue. And we'll be sure to get to questions in the room first before moving on to the lines. And finally, with that, I'll hand it over to Chris to begin. All right, thanks, Jimmy. Um, and thank you, welcome uh, everyone. Thank you for coming today um, to all those that made it here in person and on the phone. Um, we appreciate your participation. So uh, welcome, I'm gonna start off by talking about the hybrid resources definition we wanted to clarify um, and then walk through the rest of the discussion with uh, the stakeholders today. So I think we wanted to start off by talking about the definition that we are proposing to clarify here. Um, in the issue paper, I think we were thinking of trying to make it very broad um, and be able to encompass all the concepts that we had been discussing with developers. Um, the difference here today is to try to define the de uh, hybrid resource definition in more um, uh, uh, confined terms to only a single resource ID where you have multiple um, uh, components or different fuel types combined into a single resource. Um, and, and the difference between that, what we had been discussing previously, is this now excludes the co-located projects, which are the two or more resource ID projects, which are very much distinct resources um, in the CAISO's view. So that's really the intent here behind this um, definition clarification. 
Um, we think that that's necessary to really try to um, set up our whole proposal um, and the difference in treatment between those two different types of projects, essentially. Um, so again, the, the hybrid resources are really going to only essentially be those single resource ID combinations, and they participate as a single resource that will be optimized by the, the resource owner, SC, um, and treated as a single resource for bidding, um, participation, dispatch, settlements, those sort of things. The co-located projects obviously are still going to be dealt with through this um, initiative because they do include combinations of different resources, um, but we're trying to differentiate those and we're going to be calling those co-located projects, and those ones would be the ones that have two or more resource IDs at a single point of interconnection. Um, they are really two distinct resources, and those are treated as completely separate for the purposes of market participation, bidding, RA, settlement, um, and those sort of things. The main exception to that is going to be that they could have a coordinated dispatch as far as how much we're limiting them to their total overall interconnection rights, and then we have a part of the proposal related to, to that as well. Um, so this is just the actual definition we have in the proposal. Um, I'll just read it off for everyone. Hybrid resources are a combination of multiple generation technologies that are physically and electronically controlled by a single owner operator and scheduling coordinator um, and that are behind a single point of interconnection that participates in the CAISO markets as a single resource with a single market resource ID. I think we can maybe refine that a little bit as we go forward, but that's the real intent, um, again, to really define it as a single market resource ID. Um, and then the smaller sub-bullet I have here is that we're also proposing that these hybrid resources meet, meet uh, the minimum sizing requirements that we have in the tariff, but what we're proposing is that they at least meet one of the requirements, either the 500 kilowatts for a participating generator or uh, 100 kilowatts for the storage resources. Um, and that's the intent of that is obviously we want to allow for people to have as much flexibility as they can in configuring these resources when they're developing them but they need to at least have one of those underlying minimum sizing uh, requirements met. Okay, so I'll pause here, see if anybody has any questions on the definition. We do have a question on the line. Go ahead. Cole, your line is unmuted. You may ask your question. Oh, hi, this is Susan Schneider from East Consulting. Um, I have a, a question on the, just that very last bullet point here, where you have either 500 kW for a participating generator. Um, does that mean that the, the storage plus the generation together could equal 500, or is it just that the 500 has to be, uh, the generation itself has to be at least 500 kW? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. Sorry, it's not as clear as it should be here, I think. Um, we, what we're intending is that either of the underlying components meet the minimum sizing requirements. So if it was a storage and solar, I mean, sorry, yeah, storage and solar, it would have to either meet the 100 kilowatts of storage or the 500 kilowatts of solar for the participating generator, okay. not combined. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Yep, thanks for the question. Um, okay, any other questions on the definition? Let's keep moving. Sure. Okay. Probably no additional questions on the line. Thank you, operator. Okay. Um, so this slide, we just wanted to refine a little bit our um, previous discussion on the size of the amount of um, or the magnitude of, of the number of projects that are in the queue. Um, you know, obviously we provided a, a bit of discussion on this in the issue paper, um, where we noted that about 41% of our total interconnection queue um, requests are hybrid resources. Um, so I want to, you know, obviously clarify that what we mean by that is that they're either hybrid resources or co-located resources under this definition clarification um, because they don't really have to specify that they're going to be under a single resource ID or um, co-located with two or more resource IDs at the time that they enter the queue as a project, uh, but they do they actually select that when we get to the new resource implementation process phase um, and they start to begin commercial operations. So that's what we wanted to specify here. 
Um, you know, it's, it's over 35,000 megawatts in the queue right now of these either hybrid or co-located projects. And we also wanted to uh, make a bit of a clarification in stating that historically we've seen about 7% of those uh, number of megawatts in the interconnection queue actually achieve commercial operation. So of, of the megawatts that we see in, in the queue right now, we're expecting that about 2,500 megawatts of those would actually um, be able to make it to commercial operation. So that, that's just an uh, you know, initial kind of magnitude type discussion that we point that we wanted to put out. Um, these things can change though, obviously, as more resources come into the queue, different types of procurement targets are established um, you know, by the, by the uh, state agencies and those sort of things obviously could change that number, but that's just what's in the queue that we expect to actually achieve operation um, at, the, at the moment. Okay, um, any questions on number? Yeah, sure, go ahead. This is Boy Akil from 8 Minute. Um, I was wondering if you expect that 7% number to change in a post-SB100 world. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know, Bob, would you like to yeah, address that? Go ahead. Yeah, I think um, this is Bob Emmert with the ISO. That number is a historical number, and it was really based on a period of time up to the day where the load serving entities were purchasing a lot of uh, capacity through uh, procurement proceedings to get to the 33% required by 2020. So what happens between now and, and 2030 to get to 60% is it's kind of unknown. But that, that number, you know, could easily change. I wouldn't be surprised for a while it actually goes down and there's not a lot of procurement that happens in, you know, in the next, I don't know, maybe five years. But after that, I think things will pick up as we get closer to 2030. That's my personal thinking. But uh, at any rate, that's based, the 7% is based on historical numbers. Yeah, and I would note as well that we, there is a perhaps impact of the various tax credits that might cause maybe an uptick um, for a little bit and then, uh, you know, perhaps a drop off after that. So I think that's all just, you know, possible um, guesses of what might actually happen. But um, thanks for that, Bob. Okay, let's go to the um, phone line. Any questions? If you have questions on the line, Cole, your line is unmuted. You may ask your question. Uh, good morning. This is uh, Alva from PG&E. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I wanted to uh, just on on the uh, on slide eight. I'm sorry, I missed uh, the. I was trying to figure out whether it was star two or pound two. Um, the uh, exception to the, the rule, the coordination of dispatch and operations in the case of co-located projects, I just wanted to ask whether the, you're assuming that um, limit is being enforced in the CAISO market systems or CAISO operationally or by the market participants. I, I wasn't clear. About Sure. Uh, good question. I think we will talk a little bit more about this later in our uh, discussion of the interconnection rights constraint that we're proposing. Um, but, but at a high level, to answer your question now, um, currently we limit the the overall injection um, of, of co-located projects by um, limiting their PMAX and the master file to a combined output that equals their interconnection rights. Um, and we identified this in the issue paper as being a potential itch, issue or barrier um, to participation that could maybe strand some of that asset um, and so, or, or not allow for the ISO to dispatch part of that generation of the underlying uh, different projects, uh, different resources, excuse me. Um, so that's how it works today and we're intending to create an interconnection rights constraint that would allow the market to um, see the true PMAX of each of the um, co-located resources and then dispatch those accordingly. Um, and, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that um, later today. Okay, okay, that? I, I, that's great. I, 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 but so the market systems will actually have a constraint representing that. That's your proposal at any rate at this point. That's correct. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for your question. Uh, anyone else on the phone? We do have an additional question on the line. Paul, your line is unmuted. You may ask your question. Yes, 
Good morning. Uh, my name is Joseph Abuleman. I'm calling from the California uh, Public Utilities Commission, uh, Office of Public Advocates. Uh, my question is on slide nine. Uh, it's still not clear to me the definition of the hybrid resources. Now, what is the 500 kW the minimum uh, for, for, for generation, and is the 100 kW the minimum for storage? What if it's a, a resource is 400 kW? Does that mean that that generation will not be allowed to participate as a hybrid resource? So we're proposing that either of the resource components meet either of the minimum participation sizing requirements. So um, if, if the if the uh, participating generator component was 400 kilowatts, then we would expect that the storage component would be at least 100 kilowatts to qualify. Um, if if both were under if the storage was under 100 kilowatts and the participating resource, uh, participating generator component was under 500, then we would say that that did not meet the minimum requirements. Okay, then. Thank you very much. Now it's a, a whole lot clearer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any final questions on the phone before we move on? There is one additional question on the phone. Call your line is unmuted. You may ask your question. Hi, this is Susan Schneider, Phoenix Consulting, and I, I apologize. I think I thought what you just told the last caller was different from what you told me when I asked about this last bullet point here. Um, I thought you said before that the 500 kW applied, the minimum 500 kW would have would be for the generation only. But it sounded like you said to this other caller that, uh, and maybe I misunderstood, that you could have generation below 500 as long as the generation and the storage together totaled 500. Is that? Did I get that? Okay. This week no, that's, right. that's not right. Sorry, Susan. So let me let me try to make this really clear. I think we're going to have to make some clarifications to this point in the next proposal, obviously. But um, it's it's going to be that either of the components has to meet either of its associated minimum sizing requirements. If both of them don't meet it, either one of those, even if combined they're above 500. If it was 400 mega, 450 megawatts of of solar and 50 megawatts of storage, then it would not meet the overall requirement. Sorry, yeah, kilowatts, excuse me. Okay. Um, so I apologize if I confuse you there, Susan, but that's that's the intent. Does that make it more clear? Well, yeah, because I think you told the last uh, last caller that if the generation was four, the solar was 400, you'd expect the storage to be at least 100. But that's that. Um, okay, so the one hundred, so they would qual that resource would qualify because the storage was one hundred, not because the two of them totaled five hundred. Yes, yes, exactly. Thank you. Yes, sorry for the the, the numbers there might have been the confusing factor. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, like for instance, so let let me just try to make another example. If it was two hundred and fifty mega or two hundred and fifty kilowatts of solar and a hundred kilowatts of storage, then it would still qualify even though it wasn't 500 kilowatts overall. Okay, and if it was 200 megawatts of, um, let me see if I can get to it, if it was 400 megawatts of, um, so, or, okay, let's call it 450 megawatts of solar um, and, uh, and 75 megawatts of storage, it still wouldn't qualify, even though the two together are both more than 500. Uh, yeah, but kilowatts, but yes, that's what we're intending. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, kilowatts, <laughs> sorry. Okay, great, thank you for that, I appreciate it. Okay, yeah, thanks for the clarification. Sorry for any confusion that we uh, caused by that example discussion, but I hope it's clear now. Um, we will try to make maybe perhaps do some examples um, for our uh, follow-up revised draw proposal and make that more clear. Okay, any other questions on the phone? There are no additional questions on the line. All right, thank you. Go ahead, in the room, John. Yeah, John, from the first floor. I'm going to ask a stupid question here. I'm assuming you mean fuel sources. You know, I read the hybrid resource definition, multiple generation technologies. I'm pretty sure you don't mean a combined cycle qualifies there, right? Or you might have like a steam turbine and gas. Um, you know what I mean? So, because those are, yeah, like it, for instance. So let's just take a gas and and storage example. So well, yeah, gas and storage, but like a like a combined cycle, or you may have a ST and a CT. Those are two different. Yeah, well, I don't think you mean that here. No, we don't. No, yeah, it would, so. so that would be considered, you know, single participating generator would have to meet the 500 kilowatt requirement. Yeah. 
storage would have to meet the 100 kilowatt. Yeah, so this is more different, multiple fuel sources or yeah. sources. Okay. Yeah, perhaps this, this uh, point here applies a little bit better to like the traditional storage and solar idea rather than the gas and storage concept if there is a, you know, like multi-stage generator or something like of that nature. Um, so we can try to clarify that as well. But thanks for the question. Go ahead over here. Trip Ballard with Terragen. Uh, currently in the co-located uh, scenario today for a behind-the-meter application where you have a, a resource, of, a variable resource that has the GIA limit, adding storage to that, how, are you alloc how, how would one allocate the Pmax according to the two separate master files, and would you essentially strand capacity? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think I'd like to go into that a little bit more when we get into that section of the proposal later today, but at a high level, we're, we're proposing that the resource owner would work with the ISO to select the appropriate level of Pmax um, in, the, in the interim until we actually get this interconnection constraint in place, and then you would be able to just have the true Pmax of each of the component different resources, um, and then, you know, the, the market would optimize both of those um, to, to be able to be within that limit. <clears throat> All right, um, let's keep going on through the business use uh, and or use case and business drivers discussion. Um, so Jimmy noted a little bit about what our objectives are, but I'll go over it a little bit uh, more further. So obviously we've heard a lot of discussion from developers and stakeholders about what might contribute to the development of hybrid resources and co-located um, projects. So the intent here is to have a dialogue um, and continue to, to discuss that and put some things in writing about what we think are the motivations behind um, the development of these resources. Um, we also think that as we move forward, we can use that to help inform if we should uh, you know, develop different options for participation or configuration or somehow um, provide uh, some guidance to developers about what the most appropriate um, configurations would be or modeling. Um, decisions would be to accomplish those objectives that we think are going to you know, be discussed a little bit here um, today. So we'll use this, hopefully, and some of the feedback we get from stakeholders to pro provide some additional guidance in, in future proposals um, about you know, the different charging capabilities of different selections and things of that nature. Um, and, and hopefully this should be um, provide some guidance. Okay. so. In this draft proposal, we initially identified the following uh, different business drivers. Um, that I'll go through these and discuss each one um, at a high level. So the first is enhancing renewable energy production. The second would be shifting energy production and price arbitrage. Um, then we have providing ancillary services, capturing the investment tax credits, improving resource characteristics, um, capturing resource adequacy value and leveraging DC coupling benefits. And I just wanted to note that the ISO believes that there's going to be a lot of these different business drivers that overlap that may be used by developers um, as in their participation um, and to, to justify developing these projects. Um, but we do believe that there's probably a, just a few primary use cases that will produce most of this development and most of the uh, economics behind the, the development of these resources. <clears throat> Okay, so um, if anybody wants to jump in during this discussion, go ahead and raise your hand. Sure, go ahead. Hi, this is Mayhol Patel with First Solar. On the previous slide, do you anticipate things like black start capability and hours reporting to fit into any of those bullets? Um, black start capability, that might be something that would be a, a driver. I don't think that we would anticipate that would be a major driver behind the development of these type of resources, but um, I think that might be. I, I'm definitely not an expert on Black Start, but um, I don't know. Maybe we could include something along that nature, um, you know, for for part of these uh, discussions going forward. Um, and then, as far as outage reporting goes, I think um, I think we're intending that outage reporting would be need to be done for all all resources generally. So I don't know if that is necessarily you know, a driver behind the development of these hybrid ones specifically. Um, but maybe if you could expand on what you meant by that a little bit. Uh, we can talk more when we get to sort of how the, you know, the PMAXs are bifurcated between the two. But if you had one of the two projects on an outage, 
how would you reflect that in terms of overall availability, seeing as the PMAX is kind of clipped from the entire sum of the project? Okay. Yeah, sure. I, I understand what you're talking about now. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think we didn't really include that here under these drivers or use cases because necessarily we think that right now when we have those um, two resources under a co-located project, those are going to be completed completely set up. Um, treated completely separately, excuse me, so for outages. If one goes on outage, there's not a dynamic capability for you to, like, increase your PMAX on the other one or anything like that because the master file takes some time to update and things of that nature. So that's why we haven't discussed that, but we can we can talk a little bit about that later on. All right. Um, let's keep going through these use cases. So this is a big one. Obviously, we think enhancing renewable energy production is going to be a major driver here um, for these hybrids. Um, most of the folks we've talked to have included the concept of adding um, storage to solar um, or storage to wind resources. We think renewable firming and smoothing is possible with um, that addition of storage uh, to these renewables, and obviously that the intent there is to fill in the production um, of variable energy resources to ensure that the output of these renewables is um, more consistent and predictable. Um, hopefully that should help with our, some of our variability um, and flexibility needs. Um, and then for developers that could um, that, that are participating under this single resource ID hybrid model, that should be able to allow them um, to meet their market awards and, and allow for um, you know that that production to to really be um, more smoothed out. Um, also, we, this is going to help avoid curtailment or um, essentially allow for periods of curtailment to have the um, combined resource store some of that ener uh, renewable energy and then release it later in the uh, later in the evening ramp periods when uh, we wouldn't be curtailing any anymore um, or have additional um, need for curtailment. <clears throat> okay, um, the next one, shifting energy production and price arbitrage. This is one we, we've heard from developers that think they might be able to do this if the pricing is correct. The idea behind it is obviously moving energy production from low price periods um, and storing that energy and then releasing it later when market prices are higher. Um, this, is cap this, this capability is going to be possible by adding um, storage to these renewables, um, and, and we think that that might be one of the ways that people could develop these resources and have uh, the finances make sense um, and contribute to the economics behind it. Um, I think we've heard a bit of difference in, in opinions on how much that price spread needs to be to make this effective, um, but, but that's one of the drivers that we're also thinking might, might be one of the reasons folks develop these hybrids. Um, okay, the next one, providing AS, our ancillary services. Obviously, we, we've already talked about how these resources could provide ancillary services similar to traditional generation. Um, I think we've we've seen some examples of combinations of so, uh, storage and gas resources already online um, that allow resources to um, provide um, basically essentially uh, ancillary services in a, in a way that is improved as uh, opposed to just being standalone resources. Um, so when you add some storage to these hybrid resources, you, you don't have to have um, a, a traditional generator online and spinning or synchronized. You can, since they would be inverter based, they can just be available to the grid almost immediately. Um, and obviously, if you had an energy storage um, component, that just needs to be charged up and ready for dispatch to provide those kind of um, ancillary services. Okay, the next one is capturing investment tax credits. Um, obviously, we've heard from developers that this is an important piece. Um, in their uh, decision making for developing these resources, um, so right now the, uh, there's a federal investment tax credit for storage um, that says that uh, or that indicates that if you charge the um, sto co-located storage with the uh, renewable energy for above 75 percent of the time, then you would be eligible for this investment investment tax credit. Um, and that would be 30% for these systems that are 100% uh, charged by um, renewables. And then um, it, it goes down a little bit if you uh, charge from the grid or other um, generation that's not renewable. 
Um, but, but we do think that that's not a huge concern for most developers and that there's, you know, some ways that they can ensure that they capture most of that tax credit by the, their accounting and um, of, of those types of uh, charging and discharging of the storage capability. But we think that this one obviously is going to apply to anyone that gets um, these resources uh, started to be built before that, uh, you know, investment tax credit starts to roll off in the next few years. The next one, um, another driver we think is important is improving resource performance characteristics. So obviously today, um, traditional generators can provide services like an, um, ancillary services and might be required to operate at lower than uh, optimal levels when they're just waiting there to be dispatched or um, awarded for those kinds of services, but then have to be um, sitting at standby or minimum operating level to be able to provide that. Um, so again, you know, that, that could be um, impactful if the, you know, periods of, of high supply in the middle of the day, um, but we still need those kind of services from traditional resources that could um, add some additional costs and possibly reduce environmental benefits. So add storage to the generation technologies that can also enhance their characteristics um, and be able to provide that kind of service without um, perhaps those minimum load burdens. Um, and additionally, we think that it can also in increase some resource characteristics such as their minimum ramp or minimum load uh, figures. Next, we want to talk about the driver of capturing RA value. So obviously, we've heard that resource adequacy is a, a big uh, part of resources, uh, economics, or finances. Um, so we think that obviously once we've figured out how to qualify these resources and count their capacity, folks will want to capture that resource adequacy value. Um, we also think that when you combine renewables with these um, storage devices that could drive some synergies that may be able to enhance the overall RA value, and obviously that's going to be an ongoing discussion um, that will probably include the um, Public Utilities Commission as well on how to actually value those resources, um, but we think that this is going to be a big component of the drivers behind them as well. Lastly, leveraging DC coupling benefits. Um, we think that some developers have, you know, noted they want to have DC coupling options because it can lower their overall capital costs. Um, it can also uh, allow for higher uh, round-trip efficiency. Um, there's other benefits it can do as well, such as energy clipping, recapture, low-voltage harvesting, um, and, and also ensuring the um, capturing of that investment tax credit. So there's a lot of things you can do with it. Um, Personally, I've heard some discussion about the sizing of DC coupling kind of being limited to perhaps um, smaller projects, maybe below 40 or 30 megawatts. Um, so, you know, I think that that cost benefit is going to need to be done by the developers, but that's something that um, I hadn't previously been privy to um, and I thought was kind of interesting. Um, so, we obviously think that folks are going to do this. Uh, types of these projects, so that, that's one of the cases of business drivers behind this. <clears throat> Sorry, folks, a little bit of technical difficulties and glitching on the mic there. Um, I think that sounds better. Uh, everybody hear me good? Okay. Um, Okay, so those are the those are the drop business drivers and use cases we wanted to discuss with folks. So I'll open up for questions. There's one on the line, and then we'll uh, go to the room. Go ahead, operator. Cole, your line is unmuted. You may ask your question. Hi, um, this is all about PG&E. Um, I think uh, you've laid out the use cases really nicely here. The one that I'd I'd really like to get some education on from not not from Kaiso or and we obviously don't have expertise on it is what is the nature of the 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 constraints that uh 
suppose that the primary business case is the investment tax credit, and the constraint is not 100%, because if it's 100%, I'm, I'm guessing for some period at least there could be a mechanical shutoff so that the battery cannot charge when the solar uh, either the solar is not producing, or when the battery is when the battery, obviously when the battery is fully charged, then there's no more capability to take uh, from anywhere else. But if the solar were not, for example, producing, then the battery would not be able to charge. But in the 75% case, it sounds like that's a constraint that would basically be managed by the market participant, and it would, could be a long-term constraint. I wanted to just see whether. Um, market participants who are looking at that model, if, they, if that's how they see it as essentially a, an internalized constraint on how they're um, – it's essentially accounting, like they're looking at when they're um, uh, generating from the solar resource and they're matching that to charging up to some point, uh, and then they allow themselves to charge from the market up to some point to to meet a constraint is is that kind of the way they're looking at it, or are they looking at it as something that's supposed to be enforced externally to themselves? Uh, thanks for the question. I think that that that's a good um, discussion item for perhaps anybody that might want to jump in and answer. Um, I I will just at least take a stab at it. I think that the intent that the Kaiso has heard from developers is that it is somewhat of a, more of an accounting exercise and that they would probably need to manage that um, charging and discharging and um, accounting of w when and how those uh, storage devices are charged uh, behind the scenes essentially on their own uh, and we, the CAISO doesn't really intend to be trying to manage that sort of thing. Um, so that, that's our perspective. I'll open it up to anybody else in the room. And John looks like he wants to answer. Go ahead. Yeah, John, first of all, I think just Point of clarification, this um, restriction would apply for roughly the first six years. After that, um, we don't have that same constraint from an ITC perspective. So uh, certainly, though, in that first five to six year window, we would be prioritizing as much as possible charging the, uh, the battery from the renewable resource. If you fall below that 75%, it's, a, it's an absolute cliff. You get uh, no tax credit benefit. Um, so, the, you know, from a hybrid resource perspective, I think this is fairly straightforward um, for your co-located to resource ID structure where the ISO may have more capabilities of dispatching the two resources separately. I think that's where we may start to get a little bit concerned with how that would functionally work uh, in an ITC world. But again, this is a, a tem temporary issue for the first, you know, six years of the project. Is, that, is the constraint on an annual basis? Yes, that is correct. So, if, if at the end of so towards the end of the year, if you find that you are hitting that constraint, you would simply not allow the um, battery to charge, except when you could uh, match it directly to the solar production. Basically, you would enforce that constraint in terms of how the how the, the battery was bid or scheduled. I, I guess I'd approach it from a different direction. I think we would be in very cautious with grid charging to begin with, uh -huh. um, because every megawatt hour coming from the grid is going to reduce your um, your ITC benefit, right? And so you start at that 100% that charged by PV, we have 30% ITC. Every megawatt hour from the grid is reducing that number until it gets to 75. So there's an economic trade-off where sometimes it may make sense to take um, from the grid in certain circumstances, um, but that I would say is a, a an explicit use case that the developer would be looking at, um, not the norm. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate your, your talking about that. Any other stakeholders have any thoughts or opinions on that point? Okay. Um, any other questions or comments on any of these business drivers um, or use cases? Sure. Yeah, Brian Rahman with Z Global. I think it was going back to slide 15, and I'm not sure if this is necessarily the right forum, but in terms of the flexibility that energy storage brings to specifically solar hybrid projects, how is that being looked at in the study process? Um, we've seen some conflicting responses from whether it's PG&E, Edison, or the ISO in terms of 
what you look at in the study process at peak times when we know we're maybe shifting that energy to a different time of the day as opposed to hitting the grid at the worst possible time, for example, in the middle of the day. Is that, I know that's not necessarily part of this discussion, but is that a, any comments on, on what may be changing in the study process? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't think I can answer that very uh, thoroughly, but uh, Grant looks like he wants to answer. I think he might have some insights as well yeah, from a stakeholder uh, perspective. Go ahead. Yeah, Grant McDaniel, well, I just, just note that there's a generation deliverability stakeholder initiative. I think tomorrow is the meeting, and they do address this. Thank you. Yeah. And I know that we are contemplating, you know, how we should address this in our transmission planning process and that deliverability study process. And there is discussions ongoing and through the CPUC's IRP process about how to actually um, address some of these different issues. So um, I'll leave it at that, but I think that that is a, a very good question and a fair issue to, to think through um, further. But we, we might be able to pull in some additional information through from those other uh, sources to try to bolster this part of the discussion a little bit for future iterations. So thanks for your question. Okay, anything else Another on the phone, maybe? Anything on the phone, operator? We do have an additional question on the phone. Cola, your line has been unmuted. You may ask your question. Yeah, hi, Susan Schneider, Phoenix Consulting. On uh, slide 20 on the DC coupling benefits, I know there's been some concern that adding AC coupled storage might have some issues with short circuit duty or something like that if you're adding inverters, whereas the DC coupling seems not to have those kind of um, those kind of complications. On the other hand, there is not a DC coupled meter, so you're kind of stuck with the scheduling coordinator metered entity um, applet, uh, as issues as I know we talked about before and we may talk about when we get to the metering. But um, but the idea that you can have DC coupled storage and not have a short circuit duty impact, I think, is the at least some of the some of the the discussion around you know how to add storage. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. I, I don't know exactly all the discussion that's gone on related to the short circuit duty issue. That's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse, but, uh, but I did learn a bunch of new things about some of the benefits like the energy clipping and low voltage harvesting that DC can do. So, um, I think, I think those are some interesting things to, to think about for developers. Um, you know, Susan, I'd also just note that I heard, um, you know, your point about the, the metering. Um, and, and so I'll just reiterate that for everyone. We don't we don't currently have any DC certified meters um, uh, at the ISO, but I think we are hoping that that does get developed um, so that we can have CAISO metered entity status for people that want to use DC meters as well. But right now we we only have that option of them being a SC metered entity um, and and using the the non certified meters and then providing their own metering information to the ISO. Um, so hopefully that can get addressed um, and help, you know, enhance the, the benefits of, of these kind of DC coupled um, approaches. Okay, is I still actively discussing okay. that with any of the metering uh, entities or from manufacturers? So we kind of, in our, in our, we had the technical, kind of a technical workshop or a, a, a more of a metering and telemetry discussion, or, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. and. Right. Um, and I think during that we kind of tried to explain that we wanted some folks to potentially um, develop the DC certified meters um, and, and, you know, come to ISO and get that certified. I think there's also some discussion that that has to get done through some of the standards um, processes outside of the, the ISO, um, and I'm not an expert on that. But I, So I think that either way something's going to happen on that, um, and so hopefully sooner than later. Um, but but I don't have a good idea of exactly when or how that um, occur. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, any other comments, questions on these use cases? All right. Let's keep moving forward. So um, the next section I want to talk about is going to be on forecasting, and this is going to blend a little bit of forecasting and some of the approaches that the the market's um, updates we want to do um, related to the, the forecast in these hybrid resources. Um, so to kind of set this up a little bit, um, one of the important pieces that we discuss in the issue paper is that hybrid resources, um, when you add anything that's not a VER component or an EIR component of a resource to these, then they no longer can be treated as a VER or an EIR or PIR type of a resource, um, you know, and that's 
simply due to the fact of the FERC Order, Order 764 definition of variable energy resources and then our Appendix A definition of EIRs um, as well. So with that in mind, we still want to be able to do forecasting and, and, and apply some of the similar type of approaches um, that we do today for EIR resources, um, but we're going to propose something that's slightly different. So again, um, right now we provide forecasting for EIR resources only. We're not proposing to provide forecasting for these hybrid resources, but we are proposing that the resource scheduling coordinators self-provide forecasts for hybrid resources with a renewable energy component. Um, so this is not going to apply to uh, hybrid resources that don't have renewable components, um, but the intent here is that we get a forecast of the overall capability of the resource, um, including the, the renewable component and the, the storage component of the resource, um, and then the ISO is going to incorporate that into its market processes. So the idea here is that hybrid resources are going to be viewed by CAISO as a dispatchable re resource. Um, and it's going to have all of its market awards and dispatch targets based upon these self-provided forecasts. Um, this is important. It allows for hybrid resources to be optimized by the owner or scheduling coordinator of the resource, and the ISO will simply see it as a dispatchable resource, um, and, and will the, the market and dispatch will be based off of that self-provided forecast. Um, so these resources are going to be required to follow dispatch similar to any other non-EIR generation, so they cannot, you know, simply generate as capable. They're going to have to follow their dispatch targets. Um, we're going to extend the use of existing functionality for hybrid resources um, so that we can use the upper economic limit in the market and dynamically update that based off these forecasts. So that's similar to the current way we do it for BRRS. Um, in order to ensure that we have similar um, feasible market um, awards and dispatch instructions. Question over here. Go ahead. Yeah, hey, this is Mike Castellano, CPUC Energy Division. Um, just thinking about this, um, is this similar to how you guys treat solar thermal? I know that there's not a ton of that, but that is in a lot of ways sort of, you know, solar with some storage, right? Uh, that's a good question. I. I'm not quite sure how we actually treat that those resources, so I'd have to look into that a little bit more. But um, if they're if they're qualifying as already as like an EIR or a VER type resource, I assume that they would you know be getting the same treatment as like a solar PV. Um, but but that's just the, my initial thinking. I'd have to clarify that and make sure. So sorry, I can't answer that more clearly. No, no problem. Thanks. Um, okay, so. A little bit more about the details of the proposal. Um, this is just the straw proposal, so we're just trying to put out some initial concepts and then we're going to refine as we go forward. But some of the initial details about how we would do this forecasting would be that the, these self provided forecasts should be provided um, and updated on a five or 15 minute granularity for a minimum of a three hour forward rolling basis. Um, we think that this provides some flexibility to resources, obviously, to be able to provide their own self forecasting. Um, so we're going to monitor these hybrid resource forecasts for any strategic forecasting that um, attempts to inappropriately arbitrage price differences or otherwise manipulate outcomes. Um, so we're going to have to do some control around this, but we think that it's appropriate to allow for this kind of flexibility. Um, <clears throat> either five or 15 minute uh, granularity can be utilized by our market processes. Um, the other concept here is that we're going to require that all um, of these hybrid resources have a um, meteorological station similar to the requirements uh, currently in place for um, VER resources. Um, so obviously we think that this is appropriate because if they're going to be able to provide an accurate forecast, they're going to need to have some kind of met station, uh, meteorological station data. Um, so we, we simply think that it, it's appropriate to extend those requirements to um, hybrids as well. Okay, so with that, let's pause and have some discussion on this forecasting stuff. Go ahead, John. Uh, yeah, just to be clear, you're asking for a forecast of the net, uh, the POI, right? For So you don't want the, if it's a solar and storage project, you're not asking for the solar um, and then a, a forecast for the charge discharge schedule and then the uh, resulting POI. You just care about the POI forecast? 
Yeah, so our initial proposal is just that overall resource potential output, so at the POI exactly. So the, the combination of whatever's going on behind the scenes doesn't matter to the ISO in this proposal. What we want to know is exactly what the resources can be able to provide to the system um, and what the market will be able to dispatch. So um, we also are going to talk a little bit later in our metering and telemetry proposal about the, you know, something along the lines of, of the, the second part of your question where we might want to actually have the underlying resource uh, forecast for VER components and possibly the state of charge for the battery or the storage device. Um, that sort of thing, but, but we're still um, want, seeking some feedback on that, that concept. So to allow us to do these um, f forecast treatments in our market and allow the market to see what's actually uh, feasible for dispatch, all we really need at this point, we think, is the overall forecast of the combined um, resource components. So that, that's the most important concept at, at, at the start, at the outset here of the proposal, but we may refine that and ask for those other additional pieces for another number of other reasons that we'll talk about later. But as far as for the market processes go, we only really need to see that overall resource level forecast. Go ahead. This is Mayhul for Solar again. How far in advance for the day ahead market are you expecting to receive those forecasts? That's a good question. So I think we're trying to debate a little bit about how the um, offer obligations need to be provided for the RA of these resources, which is also going to perhaps um, inform a little bit about the time frames for what we need to do in the either the day ahead or real time markets. Um, so at this point in time, we're not making a, a, a strong um, proposal about the time frame of when they need to provide it ahead of time um, in the day ahead, but I think we need to refine that. And I think if folks um, from the stakeholder community have opinions on how that should go, I think we're open to ideas on that at this point. <laughs> Hi, I have a question. This is Laura from 8 Minute Solar. Um, so two things. Uh, number one, so if you're treating this as a single resource ID, which is a positive uh, outcome, um, we have the ability to put out a power shape at the POI. And I think this is what John was asking as well. So I think that. The forecast in that case would be basically, if I understand this correctly, the power shape we want to put out, say between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m., we can put out 100 megawatt solid power output. That's what you'd like to see. That's right. And I do think that you're going to end up needing the SOC for this to make sure that you can feasibly dispatch, uh, but we can discuss that later. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's a fair point. I think at, at the outset, this proposal is intended to provide enough flexibility so that resources can do the, that on-site optimization themselves, and then the ISO markets will just simply see whatever that possible forecast is. And if resources can't meet that forecast, then they're going to have the associated, you know, settlements impacts um, that are related to deviating from from meeting those awards or, and, and, and dispatch instructions. So that that's the intent at this time to hope that the market signal drive um, developers and, and forecasters to provide an accurate forecast rather than something that they might not be able to actually do. Um, so that really shifts the risk of, of that um, forecasting capability to the, to the resource itself rather than to the ISO and the ISO markets. Sure, go ahead over here on the side and then you. Yeah, hey, this is Mike Castellano again, Energy Division. So submitting this forecast, so we're saying into the day ahead, they'll submit a forecast? That's correct. So is this going to be effectively a self-schedule? Um, no, because the market might not necessarily dispatch that resource because it's going to have the forecast and bid associated with the okay. forecast. So then, I mean, it, it seems kind of difficult. So say you've got 100 megawatts or say 100 megawatt hours that you can discharge over some period um, and you you forecast it to discharge over four hours, and then you don't get taken for the first hour, say, then does, like how does the market deal with that? Do you just drop 25 megawatt hours there because you can't necessarily enter, you can't, I mean, I'm assuming you can't enter a forecast where you're gonna discharge 25 megawatts an hour for five hours. That's a good question. I think when we get into the details of some of these examples, we need to work out a little bit more okay. exactly how this is going to work. Um, but but I do think that, like for for instance, in, in that kind of a scenario, um, we would have to you know figure out how the in the day ahead market, if you're not you know re rebidding or the forecast isn't changing as the market's uh, you know 
providing its outcomes, then it would simply be based off of whatever you could, you know, forecast for and bid at the at the set of that set, um, set time frame for the market run. But but I think, you know, as you as you mentioned, there's going to be a need for you know us to address when things change um, and how those forecasts can get updated and that sort of thing. So I think we need to do. A um, more homework about exactly how this would work in different uh, market time frames. Okay, thanks. Yep. Sure, go ahead, Frank. This is Michael Wolpert from PG&E. Um, uh, on a similar uh, note, are these, is the units of these, um, these forecasts megawatts or megawatt hours? And if they're megawatt hours, over what duration? I think we're just intending that it would be megawatts, just like a traditional dispatchable generator. Um, and not megawatt hours, but I think we need, do need to think about if this is, you know, going to be modeled as an NGR resource. If, would that have a megawatt hour and like state of charge type of discussion um, included, or it, would it be more just that we want all of them to just be providing a megawatt forecast, like a traditional, um, you know, ver resource would be? Any other question in the back of the room? Go ahead. Yeah, Brian was the global again. Um, for variable energy resources that receive a, a forecast today that do become a hybrid resource in the future, would that forecast still be available to them? Um, so if they add some other component that is not a, a variable energy resource, then we're intending that they would not continue to receive a, a forecast as they do today. Um, and then the ISO would not be performing its own forecasting for that hybrid resource and it would need to provide itself provided forecast. Okay, e even the, the forecast for this, for the, just the solar portion of it. Yeah, because at that point it no longer looks like an, an EIR resource and it's no longer, um, you know, separate resources or anything like that. It's simply a single resource. If you wanted to go down the co-located project route where you have two separate resource IDs, you'd still get forecasting for any EIR resource. Okay, I, I see a benefit for some smaller entities that may not have that forecasting capability that rely on that forecast to take that and then modify that based on their storage plan. And, and that's kind of the intent of why we're trying to provide both options for folks to be able to do either co-located or hybrid under a single resource ID or multiple resource IDs. Go ahead, John. Um, so just, just to follow up on that question though, uh, if it's a hybrid that's solar plus wind, um, would they still be uh, treated as an EIR? So that's a good question. I think we haven't answered that at this point. I think we're trying to think through how that would work. Um, and I need to talk with our, um, you know, forecasting and legal about how that really fits into the current, you know, forecasting approach and then how it would fit into the current definitions of the tariff and things of that nature. Um, so at, at this point, you know, we were really more focused on the resources that add a storage component to it. So, um, but that's a very fair question. I think we will, you know, I'll make a note that we need to, you know, specify that for future proposals. And then um, I think this comes up later when we talk about ancillary services and you've, you've talked about a plant potential and state of charge metrics. Um, there's some correlation there between the forecast and then what those two metrics are going to do depending on how you dispatch us for ancillary services. Those, those are going to need to end up being kind of dynamically tied together, it seems like. Yeah, and so that's kind of the intent that we're going to have to build that into the, the, the proposal for the, the ancillary services. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about how that all work um, and the, at least the intent of what we're hoping to implement um, on that piece as we go forward in the next section of the proposal. Uh, any other questions in the room? No? Oh, here, back here. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Ian Kearney, Western Energy and Water. Um, is there any other benefit in the full PIR status that won't be received in the self-providing of a forecast? Um, in doing some background research, I think I saw something about like a monthly settlements accounting, uh, where they like net or average um, in the settlements. Uh, I'm not sure if that's correct, but, but would something like that, that kind of benefit not be provided and you just have this upper economic uh, bound that's dynamic? Um, I'm not exactly sure about the issue that you're speaking to on that monthly netting issue, but I, I, yeah, the intent is that the really the, the only treatment that would really be kind of extended to these hybrid resources would be this dynamic upper economic limit changing. Um, and, and so that's why we also specify that they won't be able to just operate as 
capable anymore. They're going to have to follow their dispatch targets as well. Um, but I, I'm going to look into that as well. That's a good point. Maybe on that netting treatment, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question. Though. Thanks for that, though. Okay, anything on the phone? We do have questions on the phone. Cole, your line is unmuted. You may ask your question. Yeah, hi, Susan Schneider, Phoenix Consulting. I have a few questions. Um, first, sort of following up on, on Brian's question uh, from DeGobel, um, is there some reason why if, there, if a resource is willing to pay the forecast fee and they have a solar component, whether they're, they've started that way and then added storage or started, you know, just as a, as a, as a hybrid, is there some reason why the ISO wouldn't provide a forecast? I mean, you may not use it in your markets and all that, but it seems like it would still be a valuable thing potentially for the owner of the resource to have in crafting their own forecast. So if they're willing to pay the forecast fee and provide the required MET data that, that a standalone uh, VAR or EIR would, would provide, is there some reason why the ISO wouldn't be willing to provide that forecast? Uh, that's a fair question. I, I, I think at this point, you know, we were just intending that we didn't, we didn't really expect that resources would want to pay for a forecast that wasn't going to be utilized um, in our processes, but I think it's fair to, 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 to explore that a little bit. Um, yep. And if, if resources do find that, you know, valuable and still want to have that capability um, and we would be willing to pay for it, then perhaps that is something we can consider. Um, and okay. we could clarify that in the future. We'll have, to, we'll have to have some internal discussion on that as well, but but it's a fair fair thing to ask us to, to think about a little bit more. So thanks for okay, the question. Okay. okay, and then um, another question, then if you if you're asking them for a forecast right now, when you when you have a, a, an EIR, the forecast is of the resource's actual output, and that and or the for, or, you know, which is also the same as the potential output. They just assume that the resource is going to generate as much as it can, and therefore that's the forecast. So. Um, I, and when you're looking at these hybrid resources and you're saying they have to give you a forecast, do they have to give you a forecast of their actual output or a forecast of their potential output because you're using it some, as a, some upper limit? It's, it's different from just the, resource, the, the EIR where you're actually, where those are sort of the same thing, but here they might not be. So what, what are you asking them for a forecast of? Yeah, uh, that's a good clarification, Susan. So. It's really the intent here is to get a forecast of the capability of the resource um, overall based off of whatever the resource owner SC is going to do behind the scenes to optimize the use of that resource. So if you're going to be charging some of the uh, storage component with some of the output from the other, you know, perhaps solar uh, component of the, of the overall hybrid, um, you know, then whatever forecast you provide to the ISO forecast capability of the resource would need to, you know, reflect that and essentially net off that charging capability for that period that you're expecting to, to operate in that in that manner and, and that sort of thing. So the intent okay. is really, you know, what exactly can the ISO markets expect to be able to dispatch in a feasible uh, manner? Okay, and so so with the EIR, your actual your actual for, your forecast and your schedule normally would you'd expect those to be the same things, but here they would be they would be different things. Exactly, and, and then when you have okay. the opportunity to bid and provide the self self provided forecast, the market is going to you know obviously provide um, awards based off of the the economics, and so you may not get dispatched to a level depending on your bids, um, and, and so you know maybe only part of the output would be um, would be awarded, so things of that nature, and then obviously if you have an award for a certain level. And um, you know, for example, the the, the sun goes away, the, the clouds come out, and then you can't provide some of that energy from the the solar component. Then it's up to the resource and the the controller on the um, system uh, at the actual resource itself to be able to say, okay, wait, now we need to perhaps discharge some of the storage to be able to meet that award. If you don't want to have the associated um, you know impact of of the settlements, if you if you to deviate from that. So that's kind of the okay. idea behind it. Hopefully that helps clarify. Yeah, that does help. And then let me ask one more question about the accuracy of the forecast. Um, I think that, that uh, parties have, or scheduling coordinators have the right to put in their own forecast instead of using the ISO's forecast or an EIR, um, subject to some kind of verification that the forecast 
not only is in being strategic or you know the things you mentioned on the, on the slide 25, but also that it has to be accurate in some way. Um, is there going to be any any verification here of, of accuracy of forecasting? It sounds like you're going to monitor it for strategic, but what if they're just what if they're just not very good at it or you know make mistakes or you know it's very different than what they said? Is there any any consequence to that? Well, I think at this point, you know, we're thinking that the since since the, the resources are really given the flexibility to forecast and be able to do that on site optimization, there's not really a good way for us to have any control in place to see is their forecast really, you know, quote unquote accurate, um, because it's gonna be the combined potential output of those different resource components. So obviously you know, things can change. Um, the resource might have reasons to want to charge the storage during certain periods or discharge it during certain periods that might, you know, differ from moment to moment or time period to time period. Um, I, so I think at this point what we're thinking is that since we're just asking for the resource level forecast overall, um, that we wouldn't do any type of, you know, some type of accuracy controls or anything like that of that nature, and we would just hope that the market um, outcomes would drive that um, accuracy because, again, it's just going to be treated like a dispatchable resource. So if you don't meet your awards, there are going to be consequences to that uh, financially. Okay. And so well, then, that, that's the intent right right now. But, but mm -hmm. just to, to, to build on that a little bit, I think we are, you know, discussing later the potential for maybe needing those underlying components. And if we go down that path, there may be a way that we could actually, you know, look at the, the accuracy of those forecasts at some point. So that, that more on that to come, I think. Okay. Well, then, if it's if it's up to if the resource itself has the consequences of the uh, the inaccurate forecast, what is the reason for requiring them to put in a med station? What if they first of all, I assume you'd allow SODAR or some other alternatives like you do for EIR. But aside from that, if they if they have some other method or means that they want to use to do it. Um, and they're bearing the consequences, what's the reason for, and you're not even going to use the data, what's the reason for requiring them to put in a mess station? Uh, well, the, the idea behind that essentially was just that um, to be able to provide a forecast that, you know, has some relative accuracy for the renewable component that it would need to have some kind of meth station. Um, so, you know, that was the, that's just simply the, the justification we have at this point for trying to extend that requirement. Um, and I don't think that that's a exorbitant cost or anything of that nature. So we, you know, we'd be open to having more discussions about that. But um, at that point, at this point, that's that's our reasoning. Um, okay. And I know this is a little bit of a tangent, but if you had two resource IDs, they can still share the same nest station, right? Yeah. At this point, I think that 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 would be appropriate. Yep. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. So, thanks. Thanks, Susan. Okay, I'm gonna to go to the room and then I'm gonna go back to the phone. So okay. uh, go ahead. I wanted to comment on the med station. This is Bora from 8 Minute. I have no objections to having a med station on site. I do wanna point out though, according to a recent EPRI study, the, the most accurate forecast provider they have uh, found in that study was using satellite imaging for the forecasts without depending on any data from the site at all. Uh, so there are alternatives that do not ex require um, a device on site, especially for the granularities uh, that you stated. We have done our own internal analysis, and if you're looking at the next 30 minutes at a per minute granularity, that's when you start requiring something on site uh, to more accurately predict that, uh, because the the satellite camera imaging doesn't quite have the capability to distinguish clouds from ground reflections at that uh, granularity. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that input. You know, if Thank you could you. include that in your written feedback too, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Okay, John, go ahead, then we'll go back to the phone. Come on, there it goes. Um, so I, I just want to tease out that if you go back to slide 25, um, the, the concern I have is, so we're going to wear weather forecast risk now, um, which is which we can manage that, uh, but, you know, there's the potential that we'll look day ahead and go, tomorrow's going to have high variability. I need to be cautious with the forecast I provide, and we may we may provide you at the PLI a forecast that looks less than what um, the actual weather data is saying because we're seeing that risk. 
So now we've got this issue where you could look and say, well, now you're, you're withholding generation from the ISO or um, you, know, you think we're doing something a little bit funky behind the scenes because you're not seeing the, um, the data from the MET station represented in our POI forecast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what, what's your perspective on that? Because at least some of the EIR system, um, that weather forecast risk was somewhat, I don't want to say socialized, but uh, it wasn't strictly borne by the person in the bidding. Sure, good question. So, well, first off, today we still do monitor for EIRs that do this type of potential forecast difference between day and real time and 15 minute and five minute markets. So that's really all we're intending to do here as well. This is gonna be potentially, there be more opportunity for this quote unquote strategic forecasting to be done. Um, but, you know, I don't think we're gonna, you know, say, oh, we got you after you do it one time or something of that nature. I think that obviously we understand that there's gonna be some potential need for folks to mitigate risk to them um, through these market outcomes. But I think the idea is that if we see a pattern of consistent under forecasting the day ahead to the real time or things of that nature where it's actually something that we think is inappropriate, and I think that, that you know, is subjective. So, you know, we'll, we'll have to think about, you know, if, we, if there's ways we can clarify that and, you know, set out some guidelines or some, something of that nature, but it, it gets a little bit difficult to really put a bright line around something like that. But, but that's really the intent. It's not just to say, you know, immediately if you do this one time, we're going to, you know, say we yeah. got you, guys, it, or something but, like but that. But it is the fact that if we're going to wear that risk, there's going to have to be thinking around how are we incorporating that weather forecast into what our POI dispatch is going to be to you because of energy imbalance. Yeah, that's fair. And so, yeah. um, and I've looked at a lot of hour ahead versus day ahead versus actual production forecast data for a lot of our sites, and there can be hours that are just kind of crazy off, and that's just the nature of the beast. And so, um, you know, I'm just curious if there's a way that we break that POI forecast into multiple components where we give you the VER, we give you the charge discharge plan, and then we give you the POI net. And if the VER forecast is different, um, that impacts kind of the end of it, but we can account for that from a uh, energy imbalance perspective that we're saying we're gonna prioritize this battery discharge given our forecast of the renewable component. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it yeah, seems like there's a way a little to manage bit. the risk a little bit sure. know, more but equitably. I think at this point, the ISO is hoping that that's all done by the resource owner, that the ISO is not going to be in the business of managing that risk for you. We're, we want to just get whatever the overall resource capability bid is um, or forecast is and, and bids associated with that. So that that's really the intent right now. I don't think we, we are really wanting to get in the business of making sure that the different components of these resources are optimized. If you can't manage that weather-based risk with storage um, included on the on the resource, then maybe the, the way that you've developed that resource needs to be modified or something. Yeah, and I think no. that's kind of our opinion at this point. Yeah, and that's fair. And again, I just, I guess the, the end result may be we're using the battery a lot more for forecast balancing as opposed to um, meeting a specific RA shape. And is that the right outcome that you're looking for? So, but we can think through this and maybe put them in our comments. Yeah, and I think that that's why, you know, in some reasons it might be more beneficial to choose the co-located resource approach where you have two separate batter, two separate resources, then then the VER component or ERI component is still going to get that same treatment as it does today and the storage is going to get its same treatment. So, um, you know, that's really the intent uh, at this point. But, again, we are going to have some more discussion on this um, as we move forward. So thanks for the input. Um, I'm going to go back to the phone, then go back to the room. I think there's a few more questions that have been in the queue for a while on the phone. All right, Cola, your line has been unmuted. You may ask your question. Hello, uh, this is Alba at, at PG&E. Um, I had a, a, just a couple of comments, uh, mostly in agreement with the, state, the comments that have been made, but um, I do think you really should define clearly what you mean by uh, strategic use of the, the forecast, and it should be part of the, the documentation for how these resources are, are to be implemented. Um, I sort of question whether there's even a need, the way you've construed the forecast as being the availability of the unit, whether there really is any di meaningful difference between the, the upper limit of, it, of the bids in the day ahead in real-time market and the forecast. I mean, it, you can 
argue there's something else being provided there, but I, I don't. I don't think it's a really meaningful. It's really meaningful information to the market or or to you. It's basically, uh, if you're going to expect people to tell you what the, how their what their availability is, that will be communicated in the bid. So that's one point. Uh, you don't have to answer it immediately because I just wanted to say the other things. Um, uh, I. Um, do think that there's a need for the the Met Station data for for the ISO to have that, because they also need to have a picture of overall renewable production. Um, I don't know whether you put your forecast together from uh, the individual resources that you've got in in the system, but ultimately you should, uh, because the, the, of the variability of output from different areas. So I think you need to have ultimately some kind of forecast of the the output of these these hybrid resources uh, of the Burr component. And I, I, I sort of go with the uh, idea that was raised by the last person in the phone that really you should you should move toward having a forecast of the Burr portion. That's what you should really be validating against and that's what you know ultimately you should be using rather than trying to uh, construe a forecast of overall availability that's going to be communicated in the Anyway, so that's just my 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 reaction to this this idea at this point is that it's not really it isn't even really a forecast that you're asking for uh, at the at the overall level because the the battery is going to be used in the market as it's used and you you know you're you're not you can't forecast the market before you get the market results so I think what you really want is a, a forecast of the ver components of these resources to validate or potentially even to um, uh, you know optimize on maybe you can't do that immediately or maybe you don't want to do that but you still need that that information and the market participants need it as well and I agree with Susan's point that you know um, if the Kaiser is capable of providing it and they're going to want to develop it for themselves anyway they should just allow people to subscribe to the, the same service and, and for the same kind of fee that they're paying now for their their ver forecasts so those are just my comments. Thank you. Thanks for the input. Um, you know, I think we need to think about it a little bit more, but that's, uh, I think it's fair. You know, maybe maybe the forecast, you know, really is like this, the bid curve itself and what you can really provide, um, that sort of thing. That's an interesting discussion. I think we could continue to think about more, um, you know, and, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about the forecasting of the underlying components as we go forward in the metering telemetry section a little bit about, you know, what we might extend to these resources in, in future proposals potentially. Um, and so, you know, if everyone, if, if all the stakeholders believe that that's a more appropriate avenue to take on this, I think, you know, effectively what we're talking about here is just that functionality of using the upper economic limit in a way that's dynamic, similar to the way we have today based off of the EIR forecast. I think that could be applied in a way where it's just based off of what the the bids that are provided are as well. So you know, that's a fair point, I think, on, on that one um, to think through a little bit more. Maybe we can refine um, what what our language use is here on on things, and, and perhaps that's that's the right way to go. So um, thanks for that input. I, I think it's something to think about more. Um, Great. So sure, go ahead, Amber. So this is Amber Motley, manager of the short-term forecasting department. One of the things is we do have a lot of the experts in the room on the forecasting side. How difficult do you guys feel that it would be for you to provide the different points that all of us talking about? Like if you're to provide the forecast for, say, the solar resource, the battery, and the POI, is that information that's going to be readily available for you as we make that decision? Um, Yes, um, the interesting part is the, the, what John was saying earlier. The, the, the variable resource forecast, yeah, that's, that's not a big deal, and it can be done in multiple granularities. Sorry, this is Bora from 8 Minutes, by the way. Um, the, the battery is, is a little bit different beast in the sense that when you have a hybrid resource, you're combining PV plus S, for example, into essentially a power shape. And that depends on how the scheduling coordinator or the resource owner wants to benefit from the market. So what is the charge discharge pattern of the battery? A day ahead, we can basically give you a strategy for that, and it is going to change. It may change in real time um, based on what the market is doing. 
For example, if we are seeing um, very low um, um, LMPs at the node, we may actually choose to withhold the solar resource and charge our battery more, um, right, so that we can put out that power later. And it, 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 I think this is a very interesting discussion, and I thought the gentleman from PG&E made a valid point. Maybe the forecast is essentially what we're bidding, because that's, I mean, ideally that's what, uh, from my perspective, um, that's what we're doing is we're bidding a PV plus S power shape to the market. How we're doing that, you know, it depends on the, I guess, the risk uh, preference of the developer and how, uh, how comfortable are they with the controls uh, that they have developed so that we can meet that power goal. Done. Um, I had a point. I think I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, so, yeah, the other component here, too, so you mentioned, well, um, let, let's say there's some other variability in the real time, and you're saying, well, you've got a battery on site. Maybe the battery makes up that difference. That could damage what uh, I was holding that battery energy for later in the day, right, which is probably when you actually care more that I've got a battery there and I'm extending the production of the, the solar project into the evening hours. So there could be a solution set here as well where the ISO says, you know, under no circumstances, you know, I want you to follow your DOT exactly during this, these windows of time um, when you're most concerned about ramping and RA and other issues, and then um, we know that we're prioritizing how we, we dispatch from that signal. So, again, just, I, you know, I, I think this is a really interesting discussion as we start to layer these complexities together, and uh, I feel like it's probably going to take another meeting or two to figure it out. Yeah, so, you know, I think it's fair discussion. I think, again, at this point, we're trying to take more of a hands-off approach where we're not trying to specify that things of, of that nature where we're saying, you know, you have to meet your DOT in these hours. That's more important than others. Obviously, we're saying meet your awards, meet your dispatch targets at any given time. The market should dictate if you're not able to do that, that you should have, you know, bid or forecast in a different manner. So that that's really where we're at right now. If, if, you know, I think we want to provide that flexibility so that developers and, and the SCs can, can optimize the resource themselves um, and the ISO can just see it as a very um, traditional uh, dispatchable type of, of resource. Um, but, but I think, you know, as we go forward, we could refine that part of the proposal or obviously in the future if, if we see that these aren't being operated in a way that's as beneficial as possible, then we might have to make some refinements as well. So I think that's where we're at right now. Um, I think there's still a few more comments or questions on the phone. Let's get to, um, and then we'll we'll try to wrap this up by about 11:30, and then get to the next section. So go ahead, operator. Call your line is now unmuted. You may ask your question. Hey, Chris, it's Eric Little. Um, I, I think we've hinted around about this, but you have some material in here about bidding, and I'm just curious: is it the intention that the ISO would have you bidding? both for charge and discharge of the battery? So, yeah, so if, if you choose that you want, if you want to, you know, charge from the grid, then I think you'd have to be under the NGR model, and then you'd have to be, be provide the bidding capability in the in the um, bid as well. And we do need to, you know, think about how that's going to work and, and, and uh, you know, specify more uh, uh, specifics exactly about the, the way that these different models would be treated under this and, and if it's really, if we really have the capability or what we need to do um, to maybe modify the, the systems in a way that would allow for that. Yeah, I guess I'm really thinking about the situation in which you want to charge from the host resource. So is, is someone going to submit a bid for output, submit a bid for consumption, and then you're getting the net of that, or is there some other methodology that you're looking at for this? Okay, so that's a good. Okay, that's a good clarification. Thanks, Eric. So in this, it, so in this situation, it's going to be only one single resource. We're only going to have one bid. We're only going to see one forecast of the net at the actual POI, and then the bid for what we actually would get from the resource in total. So we're not saying you guys need to provide a charging or discharging bid for the storage versus the the hybrid, uh, the stored, the solar component. Excuse me, um, for these hybrid resources. Now, I want to differentiate that between a co-located resource that has two resource IDs. That, that, that's what we're, we're proposing, that that does not fall under the definition of hybrid resources. Um, if there was 
a co-located solar and a, a storage resource under two separate resource IDs, they would bid um, and, and provide a forecast for the VER and then, and then bid as a normal storage resource as completely separate resources. So I just wanted to specify that. Hopefully that clarifies it a little bit better for you, Eric. Yeah, I think that helps. Thank you. Great. Thanks for the question. Okay. Um, I think there's one more on the phone um, or others perhaps on the phone. Go ahead, operator. Cole, your line is unmuted. You may ask your question. No, all my questions have already been answered uh, with the previous callers in regards to the VER forecast. Currently, we – it's playing that's mud, by the way. Uh, we, we currently have a VER resource, and we use the KISOS forecast. So uh, my question was in regards to adding uh, the battery supply or the, the battery capacity if we were going to do um, uh, become a hybrid, hybrid resource and then the risk of the weather in addition to some language clarification. So all my answers, questions have been answered already. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks for the question. Yeah, and I think if, if folks still, you know, feel that we want to, they want us to do forecasting for them, I think we can consider that as noted. You know, Susan and others have asked for that as well. So we'll we'll take that back and see if that's something that we can continue to propose uh, or change our, in our proposal. Um, any other questions on the phone, operator? There are no additional questions on the line. All right, any final questions in the room? Okay, let's move on to the market. Oh, sorry, we're not done with forecasting yet. So I thought we were, but uh, um, the next one I wanted to talk about in forecasting was for the co-located project. So just to try to specify, there's, there's a minor detail in the proposal that we needed to um, discuss with stakeholders as well on, on these. So again, I kind of talked about this already a little bit, but the idea is Basically, you know, if you have a co-located project, you're going to have separate resource IDs. Um, they're going to be treated the same way as they are today, essentially. If it's a EIR resource, it's still going to have a forecast. Um, and, and so um, you're not going to provide like a net of both of them or anything like that. It's just going to be treated completely separately. But the idea here is that we have this interconnection rights constraint that's going to need to limit the, the overall output of those projects um, to their total interconnection uh, uh, injection rights. So with that, we have to figure out if, if that is going to actually reduce some of the potential output of the VER resource at, at, during certain periods. That needs to get reflected in our, um, in our VER forecast for those, those resources as well. So um, that's, that's what the intent here is just to try to discuss that, um, you know, if, if, for instance, we gave, uh, you know, a, a, an award to the, the um, VER component or the EIR component of the resource that was below what its true, you know, forecast output output would be, then the the forecasting process needs to needs to account for that, um, and that that's the intent here on this piece of the of the um, forecasting proposal. Um, essentially, we do that already, kind of when there's a supplemental dispatch on a VER where we're you know decking the the VER resource, um, and and so then it, our forecasting process doesn't take into account the um, or it, it does, excuse me, it takes into account that additional um, reduction in a way so that the future forecast periods won't, won't you know, unnecessarily be lowered um, uh, due to that, that outcome. So what we're trying to do here is be able to apply a similar approach um, under, for these resources when they have a, a co-located interconnection constraint. Um, so for any of these resources that are oversized compared to their um, interconnection rights. So that's the intent on that. Um, and I think we'll we'll provide some more details on that in upcoming proposals. Uh, so any questions on the co-located forecasting? That one should be pretty straightforward, hopefully. Um, let's keep moving forward onto the markets and systems discussion before lunchtime. So um, I'm going to go through this uh, and then try to break for lunch at, at uh, about uh, uh, noon. Um, so I think this one might uh, extend into the uh, afternoon, so we've split up this agenda item um, for the agenda today. Uh, so again, uh, any questions or comments, please feel free to um, raise your hand or jump in and um, we'll try to catch you guys on the phone as well. Um, okay, so we've already talked a little bit about this one. I'm going to try to walk through the incorporating the hybrid resource forecast in the market processes pretty quickly here because it's kind of already been discussed and it's simply, you know, obviously very interrelated to that forecasting concept that we talked about before. Um, so again, we're proposing that we would modify the market process to consider this self-provided forecast. 
Um, I think the comment from Ella from PG&E was good that maybe it's more just like the actual bid um, that's provided is really what it can do, and so maybe we just need to have a dynamic um, upper economic link based off of that. So we'll think about that a little bit. Um, and so it's essentially trying to leverage this existing functionality in that manner um, as well. So again, um, <clears throat> this slide we're just wanting to mention that uh, how it would work in our view at this point um, related to the self-scheduling of these resources. So if you provided a, a forecast um, that establishes that upper economic limit and then you also submitted a self-schedule, um, we would simply just say, okay, the resource is going to be forecast at whatever that, that or sorry, it's going to be awarded dispatched at whatever that forecast output and then the, the resource would be a price taker at that point. Um, up to that forecast output or whatever the, the actual self-schedule was that was provided would need to be limited essentially by that forecast. So I think that might be a little bit of the interplay there between some of that discussion that we had um, earlier related to, to Elva's question about, you know, what's really the difference between the bid and the forecast. I think at this point that that's, this is one of the, the issues that we're trying to think through. Um, you know, if you forecasted the resource for 100 megawatts and then you put in a self schedule for 200 megawatts, we're intending that this would limit that award or that overall self schedule to that 100, whatever the forecast was. So I think there's a little bit of interplay there. Um, this does get a little bit complicated when you think about the different systems. So we'll, we'll try to, you know, think through this more, maybe provide some additional details in, in the future proposals about how this would really work in the different market time frames, the, like some of the questions that. Um, Mike from PC had, had asked earlier about how it would work in the day ahead time frame. Those kind of things, I think, are all good questions about how we're going to have to, you know, clarify in the future proposals exactly how this is going to work, but this is really the intent um, at, at a, you know, straw proposal initial, initial thinking level. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about is that, you know, we heard from some of the stakeholders on the issue paper related to the bidding time frames right now. Um, we did discuss about how, you know, the current um, bidding process is that generators can bid or sell schedule uh, up to once per hour at the 75 minutes prior to the operating hour time frame. Um, some, some entities have said um, that they wanted us to think about changing that. Um, so what we, we did talk through, you know, what it would take to to update that and provide more granular or shorter time frames for um, the, the bidding. Um, and, and we determined that that's going to be uh, really an extensive change to our systems um, to incorporate that. And so we're not proposing to do that at this point in time. So we're just going to still keep the existing bidding time frames. And then um, we hope that the, the proposal for the self-provided forecast and how that interacts with our market processes should provide enough flexibility for resources to be able to um, participate in a way that's still, you know, effective for them and effective for the, the ISO and the system as well. Um, so that's really kind of our current position on all this. I think there were some good questions about, um, you know, would these resources really be utilized in, in a way that would be the most effective or most beneficial to the system? And so I think those kind of questions are fair. We're going to have to think about, you know, and, and maybe maybe we have to get some experience with operating them and then revisit this in the future. Um, some things of that nature we've been thinking through. Um, but this is our current proposal to not update the bidding time frames. Um, okay, so let's pause and see if there's any more questions about how we would incorporate these hybrid resource forecasts in, forecasts in our market process. Go ahead, Mike. Hey, just a, a quick question, um, sort of comparing the, the bidding time frame. So currently a VER's forecast is updated. Is that every five minutes? Yeah, it can get updated every five minutes. Okay. Thank you. So we are proposing you can still update your forecast every five minutes, um, but just not the bidding component. Any other questions on any of this? Okay, let's keep moving forward oh, on the phone. Go ahead, on, operator. Uh, I think there might be some on the phone. We do have a question on the line. Call your line is unmuted. You may ask your question. Um, two, this is Alva at pg &E. Just two points. One, echoing what Mike was just saying, that if you're going to allow five-minute updates to the forecast, yes, that that will be a difference between the forecast and the bids. In the real-time context, there would be a, there would be a definite difference between how the 
what what you can do with the forecast on top of what you've bid. So I think if uh, probably market participants would could potentially see a value in providing fi essentially they're they're able to update their bids every five minutes, unlike other um, dispatchable resources. So I, I think that could be a, a value to resources. The um, other thing I wanted to raise here is kind of going back to what the gentleman from 8-Minute Energy was talking about is the concern about state of charge. If you're going to basically not um, do any modeling uh, in, in, at the CAISO of the VER component, then you can't really do any enforcement of, of, a, of or, uh, or accounting for state of charge in the um, resource model in the day ahead market um, and then in uh, so so that's going to be one issue to to wrestle with is cause you the, if, if people expect you to do any management of state of charge you really can't do it because the market participant is able to decide how much of their award is coming from the battery and how much is coming from the the ver essentially um, uh, if the ISO doesn't have any picture of what the VER is delivering. Um, but in real time, you're going to have some form of telemetry on the state of charge, and then the question would be whether you can do any, um, whether you're going to be doing validation on the combination of the, the VER and the state of charge. Um, it, it would seem like you'll probably, at an operational level, you're going to be wanting to do some kind of validation of that just to make sure that you're not getting a, uh, a completely inaccurate picture of what the resource can do to the uh, to the operators. So that was just a point I wanted to make. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the input. So we we have been thinking about um, that that exact scenario that you you noted, um, and again. At this point, um, in in our you know discussions and, and for this proposal, we are really intending that that we're not going to have that um, kind of transparency into what's going on behind the scenes, and that we're just going to allow the the resource owner or scheduling coordinator to optimize everything that's happening uh, there behind the scenes. So, um, you know that that's the kind of the approach we're trying to take for these hybrid resources that we think gives more flexibility. To the resource owner um, and doesn't put the onus on the ISO's market systems to try to, um, you know, see if there is really um, that capability behind what they what they decided to provide for their forecast or their bids. Um, so that's where we are right now, and I think that that's that's the direction that we would like to take with this whole proposal. Um, you know, but we have discussed. You know, would we want to know is there some you know operational risk associated with you know, maybe seeing what the ver underlying ver component is, what the state of charge of the resource is, having telemetry on the different components, those sort of things to be able to try to provide some sense of, hey, you know, we've got a certain number of bids. Let's say there's 2,500 megawatts of these resources online. If, if we got, you know, 2,500 megawatts of bids, but we, we really think if we had all that information, maybe we can only get 1,500 megawatts from them total, but they bid really in the forecast over over what they could really do, you know, then how would we actually deal with that? Would it be something, you know, that the operators have to take operator actions, things of that nature? At this point, we're saying we don't want to have to deal with um, trying to, to um, um, actually um, um, quantify and utilize that kind of information in our systems at this point. Um, obviously, we'll probably have to monitor this, and it, as these resources grow in, in size, it might be, become more important um, to do such a thing. So at this point, we're, we're not really intending to do that, but, but it's a fair thing. I think that is kind of a fundamental discussion we need to keep continuing to explore through this process. So that's a good good. Um, okay, so let's go here in the room. Go ahead, Adam. Hi, this is Adam Swadley from the Department of Mark Monitoring. Um, I'll, I'll just ask the question. So. You know, there's been discussion about not, not wanting to have the ISO system optimize the resource and provide, you know, flexibility for the market participant to do that. But I guess just from a sort of monitoring perspective, what's the reluctance in collecting, say, the VER forecast or information about how the battery might be expected to be optimized over the day um, just to collect and retain that data, like sort of from an auditing or monitoring perspective? I think it's a fair question that, you know, we've also discussed internally as well. Um, it's more along the lines of, 
if we're going to set out requirements for folks to provide data and information, telemetry, metering, those sort of things, there's obviously going to be some kind of cost associated with doing so. If it's just because we want to have it and it sounds great, then I don't think we really have a, a, enough justification perhaps to, to, you know, propose such a, a kind of requirements. But I, I think, you know, given feedback from stakeholders, we're going to try to think about exactly if we really need to propose that sort of thing or not. Um, that, you know, this is really getting into some more of the discussion later on that I wanted to have, but it's totally fine to have that kind of discussion now because obviously everyone's wondering about it. So I think it's a fair thing to think about, you know, and also, you know, how would we need to, um, you know, address some of these market monitoring related things? If, do is there need to be mitigation on these resources? Should we have some kind of default energy bids or negotiated DEBs for these resources in, in local, for local market power mitigation, things of that nature um, that are, really important that we do want to talk to, and I think that those things need to be, you know, discussed and incorporated in our proposal, regardless of if we, you know, actually propose to require them or not. We need to maybe explain ourselves a little bit further. Um, so, again, this is just our initial straw proposal. I think we can refine that. Um, so it's a fair it's a fair question and something we need to discuss further and definitely want to get feedback from stakeholders and, and obviously from DMM as well. If, if you guys feel the need to do some of those things, I think we would, uh, you know, like to discuss that further. I think just in terms of, you know, I can appreciate not, not wanting to be overly burdensome and creating creating data just for the sake of having data, but for something like, you know, a VR forecast or uh, optimization plan for batteries, something like that, to the extent that those things already exist, um, and it seems like they would have to, um, you know, being able to collect those in some way um, would, would certainly add value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the input. Okay, anyone else on the phone? additional questions on the phone. All right. Okay, so now let's move along to the co-located um, resources for the, the market systems updates that we wanted or were proposing um, in the straw proposal. So this is going to shift gears from some of the discussion we've had previously on the hybrid resources, which are the single resource ID where the underlying components are combined and they're going to be operated. Um, and optimized behind the scenes by the SC, and then providing the, the ISO is simply the overall output potential and, and bids for the, the, the combined resource. Um, now, we made that specification at the beginning about, you know, how we want to have the, the definition um, clarified so that there are also these co-located resources that have a, you know, single project and, and a single interconnection um, rights uh, figure but are actually operated under two resource IDs. So that differentiation is important. And to address those ones, we do have a part of the proposal that, that does discuss um, what we're intending is that we need to make sure that those two separate resources are operated and provided market awards in a way that doesn't um, exceed their overall interconnection rights. So that's really the only aspect that's kind of in, in the ISO's perspective interrelated between those is simply this interconnection constraint um, or interconnection rights that they have um, as a combined project, but, but again, separate resources. So what we, what we provided previously was a bit of a discussion on the potential for how the, the current implementation um, for these co-located resources could possibly strand some capacity if you have an oversized project. So I'm just going to go through this example again so that everyone understands what we're talking about. Um, so. For example, let's take um, this, this example here with a um, project that has um, a storage component and a solar component. Um, the overall project is um, 100 kilo, or sorry, excuse me, 100 megawatts of um, point of interconnection rights. Um, and then each of the underlying uh, resources, so there's uh, one resource ID for the solar that has 100 megawatts of installed capacity and 100 megawatts of installed capacity on the energy storage component. Right now, the implementation that we have in place limits the Pmax of each of those resources to 50 megawatts. So that, what does that really mean? There's 200 megawatts of installed capacity uh, at this project, 100 megawatts of the um, interconnection rights, but the total Pmax of those resources is limited to that 100 megawatts, which means that you're only ever going to get a maximum of 50 megawatts from either of those underlying resources. 
megawatts, which means that you, you never get above 50 megawatts from either the, the solar or 50, above 50 from the um, storage component. So that, that really, we think, is, is a, a barrier to participation that is you know, going to be important to address. Um, so hopefully this example makes that clear about kind of how um, th this, this you know, concern is really uh, you know, being laid out and explained um, to, to the stakeholders. Um, so our proposal, how we want to address this, um, because you know, essentially we'd like to be able to get above that 50 megawatts from the solar if the, if the battery isn't you know, also putting out 50 at any given time or you know, vice versa, nighttime if the solar's not shining, we'd like to be able to get 100 out of the, the battery so that the assets aren't really stranded in the way that we're, we you know, explained would be under the current process. Um, so what we're proposing, is this interconnection rights constraint. This is what we're calling it, is the interconnection rights constraint. And that's going to be for these co-located projects with two or more resources, not the hybrid resources, again, just the co-located projects. This is going to um, limit the output of the overall, both of the um, two separate resources at a co-located uh, POI to the maximum of that project's interconnection rights. Um, so that's intended to um, be able to optimize both of those resources based on their bids and their true Pmax so that they, we can get the overall um, uh, resource output to just be limited to that POI um, right, and then it won't strand the capacity under uh, either of those resources. Um, one of the big things we've been trying to think about is how can we do this for both energy and ancillary services, because um, right now we have that functionality to be able to do this pretty easily, but only for energy. So we, what we want to do is, rather than just build it for energy only, we want to be able to combine it and have um, optimization of AS and energy on both of these. Um, and we do have some existing functionality that does that, but it's under the intertie uh, inter functionality that we have in our software. So what we need to do is kind of use, utilize that model and, and, and for the intertie functionality and extend that to internal resource constraints for this. Um, in, in the final solution. So that's really what we're intending um, to work on for this part of the proposal. And um, again, this, this slide just expands on that a little bit. So um, it's going to limit the, the overall dispatch and schedules of the resource to the injection limits. Um, it'll have a new master file field that will actually identify that this is a co-located project um, that has an interconnection constraint. We're going to have this be able to be modeled in our um, EMS system, and so it doesn't have to go into the full network model, so it should be able to be um, allowed for these resources to come in, um, you know, in a, in a e more easy uh, manner where we don't have to update the whole network model every time that we um, add another one of these. Um, another important aspect of this is that this constraint's not intended to limit um, or impact the amount that you can actually bid from either of the resources or how much the bid price would be um, for either of the resources, but basically what we're going to do is just look at those amount of, of uh, megawatt bids and dollars on the, meg on the um, bid themselves and then optimize based off of both of those so we can ensure that the overall amount goes up to whatever that interconnection rights are, um, but in a way that you know, makes most sense economically from the market perspective. Uh, lastly, the other thing is that we think that this approach will allow us to have multiple of these interconnection rights constraints on a single POI. So if there's two separate projects that have co-located resources behind a POI or more, um, even more than two, there can be multiple different ones um, where, you know, one scheduling coordinator owns two separate projects that are co-located and paid for a certain number of megawatts of interconnection rights. We could optimize just those two behind this constraint and then another SC has a different project. We could also optimize that one separately as well, um, and, and so on and so forth. So that's the idea here, um, and we think that this uh, proposal allows for us to, to do this kind of thing. Um, okay. Lastly, and then I'll open up for questions. We also looked at some other potential solutions. Some folks said, hey, you know, you might as well just use your grouping constraints that you already have or your MSG, multi-stage generation functionality. You can do that. It'll, it'll be easy to just do that, right? And we said, okay, thanks for the input. We went back, thought through that, um, and our, you know, SMEs here said, well, look, this is going to be really complicated to actually try to incorporate this in that manner. Um, some of these other suggestions that stakeholders gave us, and 
Um, it has pricing impacts that this other interconnection constraint concept won't have. So right now we think the most feasible solution is to do the, the interconnection con rights constraint and not try to extend the functionality we have for some of these other um, combined resource types that we do today, like the um, grouping constraint or MSG functionality. Um, okay, so let me pause there. That's a lot of stuff. Let's see if we have questions on that. Go ahead, back there. Yeah, this is Doug Bocignone with Plan Resource Consultants. I'm here representing California Community Choice Association. Um, it's, it seems like what you describe, I mean, you're focusing on this uh, for the co-located projects, how you're going to deal with the interconnection rights limitation, but I think we touched on in the other discussion about another aspect of the co-located, which is really, really important, which is you'll be optimizing the, the generation resource and the storage resource separately and together, I guess, and with the entire system. And it's not quite. I, I, would, I would specify that we're not going to be optimizing the, the overall the interaction between the two resources. We're simply going to be optimizing those two separate resources at, this, at the overall system level, but, but obviously within whatever their interconnection constraint is. So if one's more economic than the other, we would choose to, to dispatch one higher than the other, but we're not going to be doing any type of like saying, oh, we need to charge the, the storage with the solar at this point kind of things, like there's still separate resources to that. To okay. I hope that clarifies a Thank, little bit. Thanks for that clarification. So I, I'm going to suggest we consider a third option, which is maybe a hybrid of the hybrid and the co-located <laughs> option. Uh, maybe the, the thing that strikes me about the discussion this morning is to, to the extent individual projects are sort of optimizing themselves, the injections and withdrawals from the storage or what they're making available to the ISO market, it seems like there's a big potential for inefficiencies because you don't have the the visibility to optimize across the hours. And so it, it just suggests to me that if we could come up with a combined solution where we allow for you know, the benefits of reducing the amount of clipping, either because of the interconnection constraint or inverter constraints, um, and allow the market to optimize, even if we're only doing it with injections um, coming from the, the at-site resource and not the grid resource, it seems like there could be benefits from that, at a, you know, an overall market efficiency benefits. Yeah, so, you know, it's a fair point. I think we've, we've heard that theme here today a little bit and from some of the discussion we had at the, in the issue paper stage and our you know, offline discussion with developers. I think that is a lot bigger lift, perhaps, to be able to do such a, a you know, uh, I'll just call it a, a combining these two different concepts of hybrid resources and the co-located resources and trying to optimize the use of the underlying components if they aren't, um, you know, under a single resource ID and have the ISO have some insight into how that's going to be operated. Um, so, you know, we, we talked a little bit about that in the issue paper that we to do such a thing would probably require us to create a new, you know, resource model or something of that nature, which is a, a, a huge lift, um, would probably take multiple years of development. So I think at this point we're not proposing that, but that, that might be something we need to, to think further on in, in the future. So, um, you know, the point the point's well taken. Can, can I just respond to sure. this? Uh, so I, I appreciate that it's not a simple problem, but if you don't do it, then you're going to require dozens or hundreds of people to try to do it themselves. So when I say people, I mean entities. <laughs> um, sure. And they won't have the, the visibility of the, you know, cross 24 or 48 hours of optimization. So I think it's worth at least exploring whether we could come up with some kind of solution. And I mean, there's models for this, right? We, we have constraints. You know, we model lots of different types of resources already, and we use a combination of constraints in the model and bids to do the optimization. It just seems like we ought to be able to do that here. Okay, thanks for your feedback. Certainly uh, include that kind of, uh, you know, discussion in your written feedback as well, and, and we'll uh, 
try to address it as well. So go ahead, sure, in the back, Grant. Yeah, just real quick, I want to comment on that. Uh, this is Grant McDaniel with Wellhead. So in the co-located, um, uh, you know, resource, you are doing that. The market is looking at both of them, and it is optimizing across the multiple multi intervals. If you don't have a point of interconnecting constraint that we're talking about, right, I'm not limited on the output. If they can both do a PNEC, it, it, they're both going to be doing exactly what you said. You're going to be optimized completely. You may have a 100% max output out of your solar at the same time you're having a full charge on your battery. The market can do that. The only thing that's constraining these is, well, what's my total interconnection, period. Uh, so if you, if you feel like you want the full optimization, then you need to go out and get full interconnection for both PMAXs. That makes sense? That's right. Before you respond, I just want to clarify as well. So I agree with that, uh, Grant, that that's a good um, uh, clarification there. But I just want to make sure that we are, what, what, what we mean by optimizing the resources when they're those separate resources is that that will be done at the system level. It's not going to be done at the co-located project level where we're, we're not going to be saying, okay, you bid in this manner because you want to charge the battery off of the solar or anything like that. That's not what we're intending, but it would be if it makes sense based off of the bids that you provided for those separate, completely separate resources for one to be charging while the other is discharging or, or you know, injecting energy, excuse me, um, then that would be done and optimized at the system-wide level. That's what the intent is there. So go ahead. Yeah, and I, I think that's part of the problem, though, is that, yeah, I mean, I, I understand why it needs to be optimized to the system, but I think the part that's missing with the co-located is, you know, your interconnection limit might be 100 megawatts, but the solar might be capable of producing 110. And if you put a battery there, you can put that extra 10 into the battery. And I think that this is going to sort of motivate people to do the hybrid option, but I did. I'd hate to lo lose the system optimization because we're trying to capture this free energy. So, yeah, I, I definitely understand your point, and I think our view of it at this moment is that, is that we think that it would drive them towards, if, they, if, for instance, you said, you know, you wanted to have that capability to net the, the two component resources, it would drive them to doing this hybrid uh, resource under a single resource ID uh, configuration. But in that, in that instance, what we're hoping is that the, the, the resource owner can try to optimize the output of both of those underlying components in a way that then they provide the bids to the ISO. We now have just essentially a dispatchable resource that looks to us like the most effective type of resource you can have where we can operate it in a way at the system optimization level that, that works in a, in a manner that, that is most beneficial to the overall system. Now, again, that is... I think perhaps, you know, a, a um, big ask of, of developers, but I think we've heard from others. I mean, we've talked with Amen Energy. They said that they could do a really good job of doing this kind of optimization, on-site optimization themselves. We've talked with other developers that think they can do it. So, um, you know, I think it is to be seen if that's really the case, and there is some, you know, issues about how the, the bids need to be done, you know, ahead of, ahead of time in a it really, you know, more advanced period than some of the other, uh, you know, forecasting component time frame. So there, there's a lot to be thinking through here on all this. So it, it's a fair, it's a fair, you know, question for us to, to contemplate a little bit more. Um, so thanks for the, thanks for the thoughts, Doug. Go ahead, John. Yeah, this is just a clarifying question. I apologize. I don't remember uh, what the issue paper said on this front, but for those co-located, projects, uh, are we able to restrict the battery so it's not grid chargeable? Uh, no. So, it, so I, I think at least all the ITCs in play, I'm not sure why we would ever pick co-located. <clears throat> um, well, I think, yeah, in that, in that sense, right now our, our view of it is, is that, you know, if you want to have charging capabilities from the grid and your co-located project, you're completely separate. There, there isn't like a back door where you can somehow charge a separate, you know, resource behind the scenes or anything of that nature unless you have this kind of essentially a hybrid, a single resource ID approach. I mean, so. There's definitely some benefits to the to hybrid. There's some benefits to the co-located, but the, the downsides to each are interesting to try and manage. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've heard from developers that there, there's a need for us to try to maybe do something a little bit more dynamic or allow for the, this combination of both of the concepts, and at this point we are... Uh, not proposing to do that sort of thing, but I think we're 
we're open to more discussion and um, exploration of, of that, um, you know, as we move forward through this proposal um, or initiative process. Go ahead over here now. And actually, sorry, um, so we're a little bit over time right now. I'm going to take two more questions, then I'm going to break for lunch, then we can bring this back uh, after lunch. Go ahead. So currently, with the uh, behind the meter set up today, where you, you would have essentially excess capacity above the GIA, are you managing it through a, a single resource ID setup? Um, I don't know if I quite follow the question, but I think what you're saying is essentially if there is a co-located project right now that has excess, you know, oversized capabilities, would we be managing that some other way, like through this, the, the hybrid resource approach? I, I think the answer to that is simply right now, um, if you go come in as a single resource ID, you're going to have, you know, whatever your, your overall PMAX is. Um, and that could be above the interconnection constraint, but then obviously anything you do has to be limited to that interconnection constraint. And if it is a co-located resource that has two separate resource IDs, they would be limited simply by their, their PMAX um, combined to, to meet that um, interconnection right constraint. I don't know if that answers your question, though. I, I, I got a little confused by the, the question. Uh, okay, let, let, me, let, me, yeah, let me take that offline. Okay, any, one last final question, anybody? Any, okay. Let, we got, okay, let's do two on the phone, and then I'm cutting it off in the room, and then we'll go take a lunch break. Um, so go ahead, operator, open up the phone lines, please. Yeah, hi, this is Susan Schneider, Phoenix Consulting. I actually have more than one question. Do you want me to wait till after lunch, or do you, can I go ahead and do that? Well, let's try to, let's try to uh, go through them now. Okay. Um, having to do on, on slide 36 where you talk about your limitations, it looks like the ancillary services is the more difficult and you, you sort of implied that the energy was not as difficult. Um, it would help for people who are trying to do co-located resources if, if you could at least get the energy fixed maybe by 2020 and then bring in the ancillary services in 2021. Is that at all possible? Um, so. We've discussed it a little bit with our technology and implementation, um, you know, project management office, that sort of thing. And it really would essentially require, like, the equal amount of work to do it um, just for energy and then another similar amount of work to do it for energy plus AS the second year um, if we were to go down that path. So our preference at this moment is to wait combine it as a, a overall energy and AS solution and then do it in the um, fall 2021 timeframe. Um, but I think, you know, we'll have to discuss that a little bit further and make sure that that, that does make sense. Um, and then after we come back for lunch, from lunch, I'm going to discuss more about what we plan to do in the interim to try to um, address the, the issue um, in the meantime. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's our position at this point. Okay, because it would, it would be economically devastating if you if you were stranding huge amount of capacity, uh, huge amounts of capacity. Um, I don't think people would actually be able to operate that way, and I think you're really forcing everyone toward the hybrid model um, to do that because I think they're just if they you know can't use half their capacity with, under these very common configurations, you're just not people just not be able to operate that way. Um, so okay, so that's then that's that's just an opinion. But let me ask one or two one or two other questions, and I and I know will be quick. Um, if you, if it turns out that you, um, if you want to actually inject, um, because you have uh, ITC issues, if you, if you want to inject from the storage, the solar to the storage or, you know, whatever, the solar went to the storage, it sounds like what you're saying is you can't, you can't schedule energy. If you, if you do the co-located model, that is just plain not feasible. You can't schedule the injection separate from the grid, you, you, can't, you have to keep them separate and, you can, and you're going to have to schedule the energy into the grid and then suck it back out basically into the storage. Um, you can't, you can't, if, can you physically inject it back and forth but simply schedule it the other way? <laughs> I, mean, I guess I'm, I hope to apologize, that's a dumb question. So I think that, yeah, no, it's a good question. I think it, it's important too because obviously folks have indicated that this ITC issue is a big deal. Um, so I think as far as markets systems go, you are operating those completely separate. Um, they are going to inject the energy onto the grid and then char discharge, uh, charge the battery off the grid. But, but I think as far as getting the, gaining the ITC, I think that that's 
Some folks have indicated that that's a big problem. I think that uh, we've heard from a majority of developers that that is not an issue, that they would be able to account for that um, by, you know, showing some accounting practices that would allow them to, to you know, still gain that ITC um, or, so or credit so for that if ITC. They didn't, um, so if they didn't physically inject it from the, so, from the solar to the storage, you think that if they, if they schedule it into the system and, and then back out again, um, and they and they physically inject it in and physically take it out again through the meters, that that will still allow them to qualify for the ITC as a, as, as though it was directly injected into the storage. You think that that's that's the case? I think that there's a potential for that, but that's not really up to the ISO to decide. I think that's an IRS question, and you're going to need to talk to your accountants and lawyers about that. But. So okay. we're not well, going to make any statement as far as you will or will not qualify, but I think we've heard from developers that have said that they believe that they can use their accounting practices and have had private letter rulings from the IRS that say that that would be all right and acceptable to do such a thing under a co-located um, resources type of approach. But, but but we can't guarantee anything like that. We make no warranty on any of that information. That's going to be up to you between the developers and their accountants and, and tax lawyers. Okay. If they physically connect the storage and solar, and again, I apologize, this is a stupid question. If they physically connect the solar and the storage and physically inject it in, but schedule it in to the grid, and then, of course, it won't go into the meter there, so it would be some kind of uninstructed deviation in that direction. And then you schedule it out of the store, into the storage from the grid, but, of course, it won't physically pass the meter that way either. You're going to have two uninstructed deviations, but they would sort of net each other out. Um, is that... <laughs> Is that some violation of any ISO rule? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I don't. I don't want to respond to that at this point. I don't know for sure. Um, Brittany, do you think you have any input on that at this point? Uh, sorry. We, we can take it offline and have it. And, yeah, I, I, I don't think we should answer that at this point. But um, okay. I think the idea is really that you know we'll we'll take that back and discuss if the, you know obviously. I think what goes on behind the scenes for a developer when they're doing these co-located projects, I think the ISO kind of wants to know what, what the kind of connections are behind that, and we're going to need to perhaps put in some requirements on what you can and cannot do. Um, but I don't think we, we know for sure exactly how, in that kind of scenario how to answer that question at this point, Susan. Okay. That's, that's all I've got for now. Thanks. Okay. Um, let's... Pause here. Um, I think I think if there's another question from the commenter on the phone, we'll take it after lunch. Um, so let's take a break. I apologize if there's any other questions on the online, but um, we're going to continue this discussion after lunch. So let's let's come back um, in an hour at uh, 1:10. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>